and uh, uh, it is increasingly being in increasingly being realized that uh, uh, you know we we know what we need to do but the how is some somehow missing in terms of uh, whether it is surveillance or collaboration around uh, any other issues from uh, uh, from in, uh, zoonotic disease perspective uh, but i think what is important is to have that kind of political will which then provides uh, the opportunity and the platform countries like bangladesh have something called a national one health policy and increasingly in south asia one after the other the countries are enunciating those policies which have clearly laid down um, uh, enabling mechanisms uh, funding sources uh, clear roles and responsibilities of different sectors uh, and then it allows for different kinds of uh, uh, you know experiments uh, in terms of uh, whether surveillance or lab diagnosis um, of course in the western world you have more number of examples uh, although the challenges are similar although f from a different uh, perspective but but definitely these these models are emerging but what you really need is 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 an enabling environment which has to come from uh, uh, our uh, sort of political leadership and should get reflected in those statements uh, preeti you have been dealing with the hiv aids uh, control program the national control program here as a part of the technical support uh, group for the uh, national program uh, Professor Jim Curran has mentioned several factors which help control, prevent HIV successfully across health systems. But he has also mentioned some factors which are challenging and are somewhat difficult to overcome. In the Indian context, where have we succeeded in addressing some of these health system challenges? And where are we still struggling? Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Uh, uh, it has been wonderful to listen to all the speakers and uh, uh, taking some um, hints from what they have said. Um, the one statement that I would like to talk about in the context of the Indian health system is that everything exists, but it's suboptimal. And probably that is the greatest challenge to our health system. Uh, right from financing, um, uh, Mr. Rao mentioned that right at the start. Uh, yes, we can mobilize funds, but uh, honestly, it is difficult to be optimistic uh, where uh, we know that health costs are not going to come down. Uh, the way the, uh, the whole epidemiology and how the mod morbidity and mortality patterns are evolving and how the, the whole disease pattern is changing, um, it is simply not easy to say that these costs are going to come down, which is equated with this uh, lack of investment in health system. And I think that is probably one of the key drivers of why our system is suboptimal. The second point that I consider in context of, less in context of uh, the uh, AIDS uh, program, uh, but in the larger dimension of health systems, uh, is actually the suboptimal management systems. Uh, even if we admit that resources are limited, but how do we really improve the, the, the critical points that can actually trigger more effective and efficient health systems? And we, uh, we are blessed with very good healthcare and medical uh, clinicians. Uh, good um, paramedical staff, uh, it has heterogeneity, definitely. But what do you really do with health systems that don't have good procurement and supply management systems, which are really the backbone of providing functional systems? Uh, similarly, um, when we come to not only uh, procurement and supply, it's about providing good leadership, good governance to systems, uh, putting strong systems of management information system. So uh, the list appears to be very large, but uh, it isn't that it doesn't exist. It's, I feel it is much more the problem being suboptimal. Uh, one of the, another challenge that I do think is we all recognize the multidimensional nature of health. The criticality of not only engaging on the prevention side, but also on the healthcare provision side. Uh, increasingly, we recognize that much of good health lies outside the health system, 
But how do we, and that has been mentioned by the previous speakers, how do we really get our different ministries to talk to each other? So if nutrition and safe water and sanitation, education are critical elements of improving health in the community, how do you incorporate these into workable frameworks that can allow us to uh, overcome these challenges? And one area that I do think in suboptimal is, Professor Curran mentioned that the fight for AIDS is actually a fight for human rights. Uh, I would um, uh, take the opportunity to say we can extend this argument to the whole issue of health. Health is a human right, but we are not able to mobilize the, the advocacy to enable for more emphasis on health. Uh, so these are some of the challenges that I think are, we are currently facing. Uh, but everything is not, um, um, it's very pessimistic um, uh, thing. And nothing has illustrated it better that these uh, health systems, many of those challenges were effectively overcome and nothing was better illustrated than when the National AIDS Control Organization and how the public health system actually overcame and uh, rose to the challenge of addressing um, HIV. So some of the good things that happened was there's a, there's a central state dichotomy which is very integral to our health systems and our health policy, wherein the, the policies are largely designed by at the central level and the sheer heterogeneity of the state capacity and interest uh, enables and uh, makes it very difficult for programs to actually uh, provide any system of homogeneous delivery. Uh, I think one of the good examples that was overcome was that some of the innovations that the AIDS program actually did was the empowerment and decentralization of many activities to the state level, giving them a large ownership, but retaining some of the uh, oversight uh, systems to enable a better central state coordination in the response. One, another uh, element that I would like to highlight here is, uh, we do recognize as public health professionals the, the centrality of access to medicines uh, in uh, really addressing many of the challenges. Uh, we have been phenomenal outside the health system space. We have this whole generic medicine and a large vibrant uh, pharmaceutical industry that actually enabled provision of uh, cheap drugs. And nothing is much more visible than in the AIDS program, wherein mobilization of communities, their engagement, actually ensured access to medicines. And as Professor Curran said, both prevention and healthcare are absolutely essential in provision of services uh, and central to the health systems. And nothing was much more uh, visible than in the case of AIDS. So, um, and that I'd like to end here. OK, then uh, let me throw some light on the elephant in the room. With the Indian law having taken a rather unfavorable position on gay relations, is that going to affect the ability to address the needs of that community with respect to HIV AIDS prevention? Or is that a separate track where health system is not really affected by that? Uh, that's not an easy question to answer. Um, I, I can only say uh, it is a challenge. Uh, it's definitely a challenge. Uh, but are there any op um, optimistic things that one can talk about addressing this challenge? I think the biggest thing has been that the national, the government that at one level is reticent on this issue, but the entire debate has also been spearheaded by a government department. So that does provide us some space to say that really this is not a public versus a private debate, but really something which has been articulated at the highest policy level. So definitely there is a challenge. But the good thing that one can think about is that the, the debate is also not only between a public-private space, but also between the government itself, which probably lends itself to maybe some solutions in the future. Thank you. Uh, Prasad Ragaru, you have headed MACO and now you're 
been associated with UNAIDS in the Southeast Asia region, and now as a special envoy of the UN Secretary General, you are very actively engaged in looking at AIDS on a global level. One of the area where I think the HIV AIDS community has part benefited a national health program or a global health program has been the participation of the civil society in a very active manner, including the country coordinating mechanisms and so on, which is not a feature of other health programs. To what extent have you seen that as a major strength and how did, in India itself, did the government overcome its somewhat reluctant uh, attitude towards the civil society engagement? Well, I think, as I said uh, initially, I think the participation of the communities, uh, the, the people living with HIV and also the vulnerable communities, the sex workers, <laughs> the transgender community, the men who have sex with men, injecting drug users, I think this has been very critical uh, to the success of uh, AIDS programs, not only in India, but in many other countries. Um, without that, probably we wouldn't have been able to sort of bring it to this level of um, success. Uh, I think there are a number of countries which have shown us the way. Initially, it is Thailand. Uh, in Thailand, I have seen for the first time how the sex worker communities uh, were organized and then they have been given this condom promotion program. They, in fact, they own the condom promotion program. It is not like government uh, going and trying to dis and distribute condoms there, but the condoms have been given to the sex workers and they were distributing among themselves. So this community ownership which has come in the program, I think that was a great model. And in India also, I think the Sonagachi model of Calcutta, Kolkata, I mean, which I think uh, was a real model for all of us for, uh, for devising targeted interventions, exactly followed the same thing. It is not that the government of West Bengal went and distributed condoms there. The sex worker cooperative society bought condoms at a subsidized rate and distributed to the sex workers. And there is a understanding among the sex workers that they will not accept a client unless he comes with a, with a condom. So this is something which empowered the communities and which also strengthened the prevention programs. So I think the involvement of the communities has been very, very critical uh, to this program. I mean, this is where I think, you know, we use this word called game changer, uh, very, very, in, in a very loose sense. But I think it is very essential to look at game changes. I think one of the biggest game changes for AIDS program is this very strong involvement of the communities. The second is, I think, um, 2000 on gas, the UN General Assembly special session that took place. I think it changed the whole dynamic, the whole rules of the game have been changed. Till the time, we have been very happy to get about three to four hundred million dollars for the program globally. But overnight, you got seven billion dollars. So, Peter Peart calls it the B factor. So, the, from million to billion, the, the, the entire dynamics have changed. So we are not looking at a little bit of, you know, tinkering here and there, but totally change the rules of the game. For example, when antiretroviral treatment was costing $10,000 per year in US and other countries, CIPLA came with this formulation, said, I'm going to give you for $400. Complete change of games. I mean, everybody was floored. Nobody thought that this, could, this, this is feasible. Today, 18 million people all over the world are getting AIDS uh, drugs, mainly because of Hamid. I wish Hamid got a Nobel Peace Prize at some place. Probably people like that don't uh, get the recognition that they deserve. But I think this, this guy has changed the entire rules of the game. I think it's very important that we need to constantly look for game changes. Not do the same thing over and over again, not do the same thing more and more, but do things differently. This is where I think other programs also need to, need to learn from it. And basically that's how I look at it. Professor Karan, now that uh, we have respected your human rights and allowed you some time to rest and hydrate yourself, <laughs> we open it for audience interaction. We speak of communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases, undernutrition and overnutrition, and yet we heard uh, Jim mention the connection between diabetes and, H and TB. We heard Dr. Saumya Swaminathan mention about the connection between undernutrition and overnutrition later in life. And if there was a pandemic, an influenza pandemic, the most vulnerable people would be those with chronic diseases or other reasons. So my question really is, how do we break these silos? Because they are more interconnected and in a critical way than we could even imagine. And secondly, to Dr. Prasad Rao, what should the non-communicable disease community do 
to garner greater growth and resources uh, like the malaria, HIV, and TB community did. Because clearly, while infectious diseases will always be with us, chronic diseases become such a huge problem. So how do we break silos, number one, and how do we improve resources for non-communicable diseases? So Jim, how do we break silos in science? And uh, Prasad Raghavaru, how do we break silos in policy? Uh, the silos. The silos on the same page, I guess. Um, and uh, you need to examine why the silos exist. So silos can occur. I, th I think that one of the problem is uh, those of us who are researchers, because by by definition we're re re we're reductionists, because we're trying to find out causes, we're trying to find out specific interactions, and a lot of times we don't deal with. Um, you know, we, we, we form our own communities and we come up with our own, our own causes. That's important for science, but, but it, uh, it doesn't lead to the kind of communal response. The other thing is that, and, and this is from a funder point of view, is that there's, um, you know, the, I mean, back when I was in public health school, they were talking about why should we pay attention in, uh, in, uh, in Africa, for example, to uh, a given problem, whatever it was, we need to do is strengthen health systems. And then you can also say what we need to do is eliminate poverty. And, and uh, I think that in general, uh, people are more reluctant to get engaged in what is seen as uh, problems that are, are more uh, related to national unity than they are to anything else. So I, I think that. I think there's a, you know, as the problem gets larger and the causes get more widespread and, and more diffuse, it's harder to garner um, solidarity around it. That, that's true for world peace. I mean, it's true for lots of problems that, that create, you know, are difficult for us to deal with. And uh, it's easier to deal with something that's more specific and, and delimited. Uh, for example, the term chronic conditions is not as compelling as renal failure. Or diabetes, I think, has, has a, a broader uh, constituency building possibility than, than chronic conditions. Because chronic conditions sound like everything else. So you have to figure out how to bring these things together and bring the constituencies together to get attention to the problem. Should treat health is not, it, health is not just a medical problem. Health is something beyond that. Health is a lifestyle. You know, unless you, you rem pull out health, whether it is uh, cancer or diabetes or where it, out of the consulting rooms of doctors and make it a community-based issue, you will never be able to sort of involve the communities in this. When we look at cancer, we look at more hospitals, more equipment, more doctors. But what exactly is the response of the family? where the family comes in, where the individual comes in, where the society comes in. We, we don't pay adequate attention to that and that is more important. This is again what happened in HIV. Fortunately or unfortunately, in the initial stages, there was no cure. So people were just dying of AIDS and nothing was there to offer to them. The only thing to offer is the moral support, the community support, getting together and seeing that the rigors of the illness can be reduced. I think similar things need to be done in the case of cancer. Unfortunately, we have not been able to develop a very strong community involvement in, in issues like, not even malaria, for example. Malaria, we, we think it is a tribal disease in this country. In fact, I can tell you interestingly, uh, I think the health ministry came with an with information that there are only about 170 deaths in malaria. If you have only 170 deaths, why have a program? You don't need a program, isn't it? So, so this is the type of uh, situation in which we are living in. So we need to sort of, I think, transcend this and take health out of the consulting rooms and nursing homes and hospitals and make it a truly community and society issue. Having healthy citizens, healthy people, healthy Indians, I think should be ultimate objective. I think health policy should reflect that. Not to have more uh, all India Institute of Medical Sciences, one in each state. And I think that is a very, very retrograde policy and that is not going to solve the problem. Thank you. Um, to say that, you know, I think we need also more public debate and discussion on, on these issues. And I don't think uh, scientists or researchers or doctors